Oh, shoot. Will you put this on my mirror in my car? For every Jew today, there are roughly 155 Christians and 120 Muslims. More than 3,000 years later, the words of Moses in Deuteronomy remain true. He said, the Lord didn't set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of peoples. We were then and we are now. So why did God choose this? tiny people for so great a task, to be his witnesses in the world, the people who fought against the idols of the age in every age, the carriers of his message to humanity. Why are we so few? Why this dissonance between the greatness of the task and the smallest of the people charged with carrying it out? There's a strange passage in the Torah. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 12, it says, When you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life at the time he is counted. Then no mishap, no negif, will come on them when you number them. The implication is unmistakable. It's dangerous to count Jews. Centuries later, King David ignored the warning and disaster struck the nation. So why is it dangerous to count Jews? Nations take censuses on the assumption that there's strength in numbers. The larger the people, the stronger it is. And that is why it's dangerous to count Jews. If Jews ever believed that their strength lay in numbers, we would give way, God forbid, to despair. In Israel, there were always a minor power surrounded by great empires. In the diaspora everywhere, they were a minority. Where then did Jewish strength lie, if not in numbers 
The Torah gives an answer of surpassing beauty. God tells Moses, don't count Jews. Ask them to give and then count the contributions. In terms of numbers, we're small. But in terms of our contributions, we are vast. In almost every age, Jews have given something special to the world. The Torah, the literature of the prophets, the poetry of the Psalms, the rabbinic wisdom of Mishnah, Midrash and Talmud, the vast medieval library of commentaries and codes, philosophy and mysticism. Then, as the doors of Western society opened, Jews made their mark in one field after another, in business, industry, the arts and sciences, cinema, the media, medicine, law, and almost every field of academic life. They revolutionized thought in physics, economics, sociology, anthropology, and psychology. Jews have won Nobel Prizes, out of all proportion to our numbers. The simplest explanation is that to be a Jew is to be asked to give, to contribute, to make a difference, to help in the monumental task that has engaged Jews since the dawn of our history, to make the world a home for the Divine Presence, a place of justice, compassion, human dignity and the sanctity of life. Though our ancestors cherished their relationship with God, they never saw it as a privilege. They knew it was a responsibility. God asked great things of the Jewish people and in so doing made them great. When it comes to making a contribution, numbers don't count. What matters is commitment, passion, dedication to a cause. Precisely because we are so small as a people, every one of us counts. We each make a difference to the fate of Judaism and the Jewish people. Zechariah said it best, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Almighty Lord. Physical strength needs numbers. The larger the nation, the more powerful it is. But when it comes to spiritual strength, you need not numbers, but a sense of responsibility. You need a people, each of whom knows that he or she must contribute something to the Jewish and to the human story. The Jewish question is not, what can the world give me? It's, what can I give to the world? Judaism is God's call to responsibility. everybody we are back here with yet another installment not only another installment but our final installment to the 10 steps to the new you program we have now climbed nine previous rungs and we are up to the top the 10th and final rung the 10th and final level the 10th and final step which is none other than responsibility and with us here in our zoom studio tonight we have somebody that at least for me personally I look at it as a quintessential person of responsibility. He's been a mentor of mine for many years, and in many ways a mentor from afar, because in this digital world we can do that. And we'll talk a little bit about how we know each other and, and how I admire him. And uh, But with no further ado, I want to jump to introduce our guest. Our guest is none other than Rabbi Steven Berg, the director of Aish HaTorah International. Rabbi Berg, how are you doing tonight? Great. Pleasure to be there uh, virtually with you. Awesome, awesome. Now we're finding you, we're finding you tonight in Yerushalayim, correct? Uh, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, no no more New Jersey for you. 
Uh, well, you know, occasionally, but uh, you know, my, my body may be there, but my heart's in Cleveland, so all good. Beautiful. So, so let, let's let's first introduce for maybe a few of our guests here tonight, either watching with us in Cleveland on Zoom or through Torah Anytime with the Chazak program or H.com. Uh, with Torah Anytime, all the different wonderful organizations we have involved with this program. For anyone who's listening who might not know who you are, let's just give them a quick introduction. And I'll let you do it because you can probably do it better than I can because I'm sure I'll get like half the facts wrong. I'm Steve Berg. Um, Married with six kids, rabbi, you know, uh, basically out of school, went to work for an organization called NCSY. I love with NCSY. Spent my next 22 years at NCSY. Uh, did every job possible, including uh, the last eight of those as the international director of NCSY. Uh, concurrently, I was also the managing director of the Orthodox Union. Uh, and that's when I left and went on to the Simon Wiesenthal Center. I spent a couple of years uh, being their East Coast director, running all of their kind of East Coast, Washington, New York, all of their operations and fighting anti-Semitism, all the different things that are, that are, that are done there. Uh, and then uh, about uh, almost six years ago, that's where Asia Torah found me, which is an international educational institution really around the globe. It started 45 years ago by Noah Weinberg uh, and asked me to come on board and uh, be the CEO. And that's what I've really done is last you know six years kind of throwing myself into uh, to working with the folks at Asia and, and, and building it back up. So, you know, I, I've often made the point that if anyone wants to become great in the Jewish world, you have to start off in NCSY. I mean, first of all, we have Rabbi Berg here as an example. And then there's countless others. We talked to Rabbi Orlovsky a few weeks ago. Uh, we uh, there's For those of us in the Midwest, we know uh, Judge Danny Butler. We know Gary Torgo. Uh, you might know Rabbi David Goldwasser. You might know Rabbi, uh, Nate Siegel. All of these illustrious people, just like Rabbi Berg, got their start in NCSY, which is, by the way, how I know Rabbi Berg. Because even though yep. I was never officially hired by NCSY, I figured out that if I wanted to be anything, I had to, I had to slip in. If I couldn't come in through the front door, I had to slip in through the back door. So in my Cincinnati days, we were trying to revive Cincinnati NCSY, and that's when Rabbi Berg was yep. the national director. So that's where we first interface. And ever since then, I've been a huge fan from before, because uh, Sally Friedman, our regional director, was always lauding your praises. And definitely yes. after, yeah. um, and, and by the way, for those of you out there who get annoyed with hearing me talk about leadership books, you can blame Rabbi Berg, because he's the one who got me started on reading <laughs> those leadership books. Hey, addicted. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think all good leaders come from NCSY. I was interviewed by a newspaper about uh, someone who had come from NCSY, Rabbi Ari Lightstone, to become the chief of deputy ambassador in Israel, in the U.S. Embassy. And they said, isn't it strange to go from youth work to an embassy, and I said, absolutely not. I said, every major Jewish leader out there, you know, folks like Malcolm Holmline, you know, they were fighting for Soviet Jewry in, in the 70s, and, and all great leaders come from youth work, and especially NCSY, so I, I couldn't agree with you more. I forgot about Rabbi Lightstone. He actually did a program for us last week with our, uh, we, we have a thing called the Inner Circle with our like, top donors, and he, he's, I love Arya. he's uh, such a- he's Terrific, a terrific guy. Yeah. So uh, anyways, let's, let's dive right into it. So we're talking here about the topic of responsibility. And, and when I saw that you you chose that, because uh, the way that we did this is we presented all the topics to the speakers we wanted and speakers chosen. Rabbi Berg right away took responsibility. And I like I got a ear to ear grin because I thought that was a perfect topic for many ways. But I'm, I'm going to let him do the talking and explain to us why. Ra Rabbi Berg, when you hear that word responsibility, what does it mean? Give us a definition. You can put Jewish in front of it or Jewish after it, but give us the definition of the word responsibility. Look, I think responsibility, and, and it wasn't a coincidence that I jumped right in there because at Asia Torah, one of the things that drew me to Aish was the, this concept of responsibility that they take very seriously. To me, responsibility is that you see something that needs to be fixed, it needs to be helped, it's something, and instead of saying, well, you know, is, is anyone else out here? Is someone else do it? You just basically jump in and say, I'll take care of it. I'll do it. That's what responsibility means. Being Jewish responsibility means we're looking around and we don't say like, oh, you know, someone else will fix it. You know, that that stone in the middle of the road, I'm sure someone will come along and, you know, you, you pick it up and you toss it to the side. And to me, this is the ultimate responsibility of a Jew. You know, this comes straight from the Bible. It's all over the Bible. And I think this is probably the number one character trait of any Jewish leader, leader throughout the Bible. Um, I think it's clear from God that what God wants us to do, God wants you to take responsibility. He puts you down here. You, you're two things. You're born and you, you die, right? And the question is, what can you get done in between? And it's a matter of looking around the world and saying, I'm going to take responsibility for this. I'm going to take responsibility for that. 
And it doesn't matter what it is. Some people, it's food banks. People want food, they want a food bank. Some people, it's spiritual. There are all these different uh, makeups, but whatever it is, I spot something lacking and I run over to help fix it. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, and 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 one of the reasons I got that smile is because, you know, knowing Asia Torah takes it so seriously. And, you know, I myself learned to Nary Yisrael, which I guess is the uh, first cousin of Asia Torah because the founder of Eshet Torah was Renaya Weinberg, and our Rosh Hashiva was Rosh Shmuel Yaakov Weinberg, both Zechot Tzadik and Kodesh and and the push of that idea of responsibility and taking responsibility, and uh, you know we'll talk a little bit more about that and some paradigms of responsibility, but uh, yeah, that is that is uh, it's at, it's at the center of the Jewish world. So that really really segues us. You know, I'm already throwing out some great personalities from Jewish history. But when we talk about responsibility, can, can you give me a picture of somebody who, in your mind, gets it right? In other words, this can be someone who you've interacted with personally, someone uh, past, present, future, well, maybe not future, but uh, past or present. When you think about the quintessential personal responsibility, who comes to your mind, Rabbi Berg? You know, for me, it's, it's, it's I mean, there, I can give you modern day examples, but for me, it's always been Moses. It's always been Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, he is the quintessential person because he, he didn't grow up in a Jewish home. He grew up in, frankly, a quite anti-Semitic home. Uh, he grew up going to public school. He grew up going to private school. He was not really Jewishly connected. And he spots Egyptian, you know, beating up a Jew. And he cannot hold himself back once he hears and he knows of his Jewish lineage. And he runs over, you know, beats up the Egyptian, saves the Jew, and he has to run for his life. And to me, he's always a quintessential person because two areas of responsibility. And I think in, in Jews in general, you always look at these two things. One is spirituality and one is physical responsibility. And I always point out to people that Moses, right, was a person that gave us the Torah. Moses took spiritual responsibility for the Jewish people to be the conduit to God and to bring us to Torah, right? But he didn't only do that. He gave us from genocide in Egypt. In Egypt, they were killing babies, Jewish babies, right? So the same person that saved us spiritually also saved us physically. And I always very much believed in that, that any Jewish leader... It can't just be one or the other. It's got to be together. Yes, we want Jews to be close to God and spiritually uplifted, but you can't ignore a Jewish pain anywhere in the world. You have to fight that as well. So that, to me, that's why I've always been this person that had always been able to kind of lock these two, both the physical and the spiritual. Yeah, that's awesome. And 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 along those lines, you know, we mentioned before Neri Israel, where or besides uh, the Rosh Shiva, the at least for me, the person who who was the quintessential example of responsibility was uh, Rabbi Neuberger, Zechron Levacha, Rabbi Herman Neuberger, executive vice president of the yeshiva. And I still can imagine, and here I still hear it, you know, hollowing in my, in my ears, how in his thick German accent, he would say the word, achrayush, right? Like, like the good old yekas say it, and, uh, which, means, which means responsibility in Hebrew. And, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a coincidence that every time he spoke, and he didn't speak a lot publicly, he was more of the one in the office, running the yeshiva, raising the money, working with politicians for different political issues. But when he did speak, it was almost always on the topic of responsibility of a chryas. And And I think about you know putting your, your money where your mouth is, so to speak. One of the amazing experiences for me with learning in Baltimore was the, and really not only Baltimore, but growing up in Atlanta, uh, was the interplay with the Persian community because Atlanta was a, a big, uh, you know, has right. a big Persian community, and and Neri Israel was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they would jokingly call it uh, the the first letters of the Rosh Hashanah and Neri Israel was Neri Israel Rabbinical College N I R C. So in my days, they would jokingly call it the Newberger Iranian Refugee Center because uh, in the yeah. 70s, you know, you know, we won't get into the whole story too in too much depth. In the 70s, when the Shah was in power, they lobbied to set up a rabbinical program for Iranian boys. And the Shah was overthrown. They used the same connections to get Iranians out of Israel, uh, out of Iran. And he literally saved tens of thousands of Iranians. And, and again, Rabbi Berg, you could have asked him the question and said, one second, you know, I'm the same as you. I'm running a yeshiva. I'm raising money. I'm, I'm, I'm making sure the bills are met. I'm making sure the curriculum's solid. The staff is solid. I'm, I'm doing stuff. What does that have to do with Iranian Jewry? And Rabbi Neuberger would have responded, that, that's responsibility. That's a chryas. That's what a Jew does. And, uh, you know, that's something that I was able to experience. And it, you know, it wasn't only that. It was not only the Iranian community. It was the South uh, Latin American community. You know, Nair Israel is, is the quintessential organization or yeshiva that never only thought of it in front of it. You know, they took so many boys from Latin America. I know a lot of them. 
you know, that, that came over. They had a program. They still do have a program. It was Iranian boys. It was boys from all over. Because, you know, a lot of times, look, people in general, let's call it spade spade. People in general like to hang out with people that look like them, like think that, like, you know, that's the way the human being kind of works. And uh, in terms of Jews, that, that's, that's, that's a disaster, right? Jew, every single Jew, there are brothers and sisters. They really have never met them before, you know, and, and it, it's so important. This is in terms of responsibility for, for Jews. It's, it's what people respect about us. Right. What people respect about Jews is we will always, you know, just drop everything and we'll go help a Jew. And I think it's it's a huge challenge today because even the observant community has gotten so lost. We kind of get in that click and that, you know, my shul, my school. Oh, I don't know about that shul. I don't know about that school. But I, I think you're right. I think that, you know, coming from Mayor Strahl and, and you're right. It wasn't coincidence that they were brothers. You know, the head of Mayor Strahl and the head of Asia Torah, they were brothers. And in fact, with Noah looked to, to, to Rav Yaakov uh, Weinberg as his Rebbe, right? And Rav Yaakov Weinberg used to come to Asia in the summers. I mean, these, these places were like this. And these were the two places that it didn't matter. You'd show up to Asia Torah. You didn't have a penny to your name. You know, there, there's one of the rabbis there will tell you. He came in, you know, and he was an observant uh, Muslim. He, you know, and he and Rav Noah said, okay, you'll dive in your five times a day. And, you know, you'll come to classes. And, you know, his roommate almost had a heart attack when he rolled out his rug and he got that, you know. But but that was that was a whole thing. You don't let a Jew go. You you, you love a Jew. You you know, and that, uh, you find it everywhere. You know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, you know, used to stand up all day long when he was an old old man, and he would stand and he give out these dollar bills to all the Jews, and they said, you know, Rebbe, you're so you know so exhausting. Like you know, you don't get tired. You don't want to sit. He says, when I'm counting diamonds, I don't get tired. He looked at every Jew that walked up to him as a diamond. And if you and I and everyone else, if we look at Jews as diamonds. And what wouldn't we do, right? You have a nice big diamond that you could go get, right? Right? We would do everything for people. Do everything for money. So we have to do the same thing for our brothers and sisters. I have to tell you that everywhere I've gone on, around the globe, and I literally have gone around the globe since I started, I have bumped into people that have been inspired by Asia Torah, whether it be Discovery, the Yeshiva, the students of Asia Torah. And it's really been an unbelievable journey. But, but I have to tell you that in the couple of months leading up to taking this job, it was incredibly daunting. And a lot of it had to do with Rav Noah. Rav Noah Weinberg, that's all, was larger than life. He was one of those leaders that comes along once in a generation. He built something. He not only built an institution, he built people. He, he instilled in them this incredible fire and passion in their heart to go out and to change the world. Not only was he worried about the Jewish world spiritually, but he was worried about it physically as well. He talked about radical Islam, helped to start so many institutions, Hasra fellowships, Hasra reporting. Literally the last Jewish leader I could think of like that was Moshe Rabbeinu, who not only helped us to get the Torah, but saved us from slavery. I spent 22 years in NCSY. My whole life was sending 2,000 teens every summer to Israel. I tried to, to, to think to myself, what was it that I was so passionate about? What was it that I felt that, that there was this need for kids to go to summer camp, to be in that environment? What was it? And that's when I realized an important principle. That the opposite of spirituality is not not being spiritual. The opposite of spirituality is cynicism and sarcasm. Cynicism and sarcasm destroys everything. Every time, time you try to do something, like, nah, someone poo poos you, you're scared of the way they look. I often thought that that's why in Shema we cover our eyes for six words, just so we should be able to focus and not think about what the person next to me thinks. And when I look at Asia Torah, what Asia Torah does is exactly that. It creates an environment where we can be proud of our Judaism. It creates an environment where learning Torah is an amazing experience. Where keeping Shabbos is spiritual, it's fun, it's passionate. When I walk into Asia Torah and I walk through the building in Jerusalem, people cannot stop talking about God. We all believe in God in theory, but in Asia Torah, because of Noah, it's more than a theory. He is sitting here on this stage. And when Rav Noah would say things like, we can 
fight the battle against assimilation and intermarriage and win the entire battle and bring every Jew back home. He believed it because if the Almighty, if God wants it to happen, it can happen. And that is what Eshe Torah is about. It's about taking citizen sarcasm and throwing it out the window and focusing on God and focusing on wisdom and focusing on Torah and focusing on growth. It is the type of place where as a Jew we can become passionate and what Rav Noach did was he made everyone understand it didn't matter if you were a rabbi or a businessman. It didn't matter if you were a housewife or a lawyer. It just didn't matter. There is what for you to do. And we just need to figure that out. So many people in this room have taken that responsibility upon themselves. They have shouldered that burden. They understand that for the Jewish people, whether it be spiritually or physically, whether it be Jews that do know, don't know Aleph Bays, to invite them to our table, to ask them to learn, or physically endangered anywhere around the world for us to stand up. And so in our branches around the world, literally around the world from South Africa to England to South America to North America, this is what is taught week in and week out. In our programs, Hasbro Fellowship, Project Inspire, and so many others. This is what's taught. H.com. These are the lessons. The world needs Asia Torah. The world needs a strong Asia Torah. And our vision is just to get stronger, it's just to empower more people, it's to create an army of Jews to go out there and fight for our spirituality and our physical health. So, so, so Redberg, I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm, I'm going to segue now into a, a, po a potentially political topic. So you can choose to uh, ignore it or actually as you do what rabbis do when they're asked questions they don't want to answer. Either answer it or if not, tell a story. <laughs> to the uh, I'm easy. I'll answer anything I'm asked. I like to talk. <laughs> So when we talk about the topic of responsibility, you know, we, we focus a lot on the Jewish needs, the Iranian Jewry, Russian Jewry, South American Jewry. Uh, you know, it's, we were talking to Rabbi Goldvecht a few weeks ago. In, in the midst of this pandemic, you and Aish have started Aish Israel to reach out to secular Israelis, uh, which, which in and of itself is remarkable. And we'll hopefully we'll get back there in a moment about how little in these times you're starting new programs and new initiatives. But uh, but what is the responsibility of the Jew to the uh, to the greater world, to the to the nations of the world, to the non-Jews of the world? And, and there's you know, many, many worthy causes out there. What what, what are you what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I think we have a tremendous responsibility to, to the world at large. You know, we were put down here. Let's call a spade a spade. God sent us here and said, you're going to be a light unto the nations. You're going to be moral. You're going to be ethical. And, and you need to basically show them how to how to do that. And, and we have we try desperately. You know, sometimes we we get kicked for it. But but we've always been there. You know, when I was at the Simon Wiesenthal Center, I always felt very strongly. I was friendly with a number of Rwandan refugees, you know, people that had had come out You know, people in the mid 90s. Right. We're not talking about the Holocaust so many years ago. Right. Which we always remember and, and we memorialize. But in the mid 90s, right, there were there were 800,000 Rwandans were, were killed in, th in three months. Right. How could anyone, you know, sit quietly and not speak up about that? And I, I talk about it a lot. And I think when, when I was at the Wiesenthal Center, that was one of the things I really learned that a lot of different communities experience a lot of different pain. And we have to be very empathetic and we have to be very sympathetic and very open. And, and I think that. Israel has done a great job of when there has been disasters around the world, sending aid. And, you know, it's a small little country. I mean, there's the amount of people in Israel, the same amount of people that live in New York City. Right. You know, you're not talking about a huge population. But but, but any time that something happens around the world, they always send people because that's our nature. We're givers. Right. Jews give. We like to we like to give to other people. And, and so I, I you know, I certainly I'm, I'm very I consider myself very outspoken on causes that pertain to Jewish causes, but I think that 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 it can't. I think when we see something, that's responsibility. When you see something, you need to say something. You talk about Iran. You know, I just uh, I just wrote an op-ed about about Iran and about the, the Biden administration. How I think that they can there are ways that they can deal with it in a positive way. And you know, I got from another rabbi he called me up. He's like, "Well, rabbis really shouldn't get." You know, I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" Like the Ayatollahs in Iran have said they want to wipe out Israel. They want to kill us. So, you know, I'm going to send the side again. This goes to Moses. You know. Yeah, teach Torah, but if someone comes after a Jew, you have to defend them. 
you know, I, I got a, a one time a cynical comment. I'll never forget this. I was working for the Wiesenthal Center and I met some some Jewish guys and, you know, they were talking about it and they said, really, you still you guys are still chasing, you know, Simon Wiesenthal was a, was a great Nazi hunter. You're still chasing Nazis, you know, like, you know, they're, they're like old men now. Really, when's it going to be enough? I said, look, the bottom line is I don't want them, you know, on their deathbed. I want them to know the Jews are still coming after them for touching the hair on the head of a Jew. And that's the bottom line. You know, people say to me, you know, they say like, well, when, when are you going to finally, you know, move on from Germany? And I say, you kidding me? We're still mad at the Babylonians. Right. And, and we that's, that's responsibility. I don't I don't let people off the hook. On the other hand, you know, when people do the right thing, then you have to you have to, you know, compliment them for that. Beautiful. You just reminded me of two, uh, one, uh, two powerful stories. One of a of a certain Nazi officer, Yamakshimo, who was speaking to another one, and this is already, you know, whatever it was, let's say 1943, 44, when the writing was on the wall for where the war was going, and the the sole goal of the Nazis at that point was to wipe out as many Jews as possible, as we now know. And this German officer said to the other one, he said, he said, we are doomed. So what do you mean? He said, we're, we're going to figure a way, you know, Hitler, the, the you know, the, the Fuhrer will figure out a way out of this. What, what do you mean we're doomed? He said, no, 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 we're doomed. The people that we're going after here still sit down on the floor once a year and mourn about some temple that was destroyed thousands of years ago. And they sit around the table and eat these crackers and talk about some ancient Pharaoh that enslaved them. What are they going to do about us? Like, what are you going to do with us, with us when this is all done? And, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of truth to that in, in sort of keeping this in our mind. And the, the second thought I had when you mentioned uh, Simon Wiesenthal's a that, uh, you know, one probably his second most famous case took place here in Cleveland was John Demianyuk, you know, right here, yeah. right down the street from us. It was right here in Cleveland. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think it goes back to that idea of a crisis of responsibility of, of if somebody did terrible things, atrocious things, and there's... You know, th there's things we, you know, this is not a, 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 uh, LL and a service make sure we're not talking about Chuba here and the ability to repent, not repent. We're not getting into that, but just the, uh, you know, taking responsibility for one's actions. That is another area of responsibility. And, and, you know, and definitely from the individual onto the family, onto the, the, the greater community. We, we, you know, it's, that's a, that's another realm, so to speak, where responsibility plays in. So, uh, so amazing ideas. And, you know, I, I was just thinking along those lines, that um, that we we did a program uh, we did a program here called the Rabbi and the Minister where I had a uh, this was uh, after the um, you know after Memorial Day which was Shavuos for us but Memorial Day when the uh, whole George Floyd situation happened here in America and uh, everyone's trying to wrap their heads around that and what it meant and other injustices and what was to what was right what was wrong uh, so a, a black minister friend of mine and I got on a Zoom and did a program together and and, and I. Here's the idea I said, you know, I said to him, I said, Eric, I don't know what I as a rabbi need to be doing right now for, you know, to make this world better vis-a-vis -vis this issue of racial intolerance in America. But to sit here and do nothing, that for sure I'm not going to do. So therefore, we're going to have this conversation. We're going to maybe try and figure out some uh, calls to action over here. And, and that's, I think, what, what is challenging a lot of times is we don't know. We, we might feel that we need to take responsibility, but we don't know what to do. So what would you say to such a person? They want to be more responsible, let's say, or community minded or, you know, more focused on these things of responsibility. But they say, well, how, how do I'm, I'm little me? What am I going to do? What I'm going to have to notice every little thing and run out. And, you know, it's, it's like I was sitting there when I was a kid and they put Smokey the Bear on TV and they said, only you can prevent forest fires. And I said, me? And like, I'm out the door every night with buckets of water. My mother says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to prevent forest fires, right? But seriously, what do you say to someone who comes to you and says, I want to be a more responsible person? You know, it's like the old joke where a man says, you know, in his family, he makes the big decisions and his wife makes the small decisions. He makes the big decisions, meaning like, you know, should America have good relations with China? You know, and all the, the big conversations. His wife, she makes the small decisions. You know, everything you do with the family, everything you do with the house, everything, you know. And I think that, you know, we get so caught up in the big, we get so caught up in the big, we're missing what's right in, in front of us. And I always tell people, you know, look around you, you know, look, look around you. There, there's there are those issues of homelessness, there's issues of hunger, there's issues of, of schools. There's, there's so many issues. You know, if, if someone wants to start taking responsibility, just start to take something small. Start to take something small, see something that needs to be changed and stuff. We, everything becomes, you know, that the, the issues of Iran and America and stuff like that, Okay, there are definitely leaders that need to write op-eds and be involved and have conversations. But for most people, 
that's not really what you be. we all like to talk about. That's the problem. And it's like it's like you know, they talk about in business. You know, a lot of times when you have like a mission, you're trying to get things done. The shiny object distracts. It's true. These are these are the shiny objects. But really, taking responsibility is about what is there right in front of us. What can I change? What can I do? You know, what's going on in the community? Talk to to rabbis. Talk to elected officials. Talk to you know what 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 can I do to help and and change things? And then sometimes it's remarkable. You know, the, the things. You know, I, I could tell you. You know, you mentioned before about some of the protests. And, you know. When I went to the Sun Reasonable Center, I remember I went to a, a meeting of the NAACP in, in Manhattan. And it was very, it was very moving to kind of be there and be with other people and just kind of show up and, and talk to them. Just the fact my presence was so moving. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. I uh, when I first uh, went to the Reasonable Center, there was a, a, a weekend. It's the uh, it's the Black Asian Latino Caucus weekend in uh, Albany. So I went I went up there on Sunday and they had a big dinner, 2,000 people. And I went there. And I had been to the Weasel Center not that long. And I really, I got put at the head table. David Dinkins was being honored, former mayor of New York City. And I was literally sat right next to him at like one of the front tables. Wow. They said to me, what in the world are they doing? Why am I here? I'll never forget what they said to me. They said, you know what? Because usually when we meet Jewish leaders, we go to their boardrooms in Manhattan. But you're one of the first people to come out and sit with us, right? And, and I realized how important it was just to show, like I mentioned before about going to NAACP meeting or all this, to just go and schmooze and talk to people. Responsibility doesn't always mean I'm gonna get it fixed, I'm gonna get it solved, right? Sometimes taking responsibility is about compassion, it's about empathy, it's about having a conversation with someone, about showing them I care about you, right? And, and I think that it's so many times we just, we just wanna get everything solved. Not everything always gets solved. You know, God has a role, role here. We believe in God. He he takes care of kind of a lot of the big pictures, a lot of the serious pictures that we can step up and we can really get some some amazing, wonderful things done. Yeah. And, and, and you know, along those lines, it's usually those people who stand up and say, like, you know, Mila Shemay Lai, you know, when, when Aaron at the time of the Golden Calf, he asked the Jewish people, who's with Hashem? And it was the tribe of Levi who stood up. So they didn't necessarily know that by standing up then, they would always be the tribe of Levi. They would become the, the, the vice priests, if you will, in the temple, just a, a few doors down from where you are there in the old city of Jerusalem, right? They didn't know that that's what was going to happen. They were just responding to a call that, that to do what was right. And, you know, we mentioned before a mutual friend, Ari Lightstone, Lightstone, Rabbi Ari Lightstone, and how he ends up being, uh, you know, if you look at the J-Post, uh, most influential Jews of 2020, I think he was 19 or number 19 or number 20. Which, which, which is a chutz, but he should have been number one with David Friedman and with uh, Avi Berkowitz, but whatever, we'll talk about that another time. But, but how did sure. he get to be the, the chief of staff of the Israeli uh, ambassador's office in Jerusalem and be one of the architects of the Abraham Accords and, and all these amazing things that he did? You, you know what happened? You know the story, but we're gonna tell it, uh, we're gonna tell it right now for everyone who doesn't know the story. When he was the NCSY director of New York region, NCSY, he uh, wanted to do a program for for uh, what he called the middle, the kids that, that, you know, not the kids who needed a lot of attention, not the overachievers, but those kids in the middle who often get overlooked. And he wanted to call it the apprentice and do an apprentice style uh, program. And he goes into a certain potential donor that he's never met before. And he needed a quarter of a million dollars to run this program. And he says to the donor in the first meeting, he says, you know, I need a quarter of a million dollars for this program. I want you to give me 125000 to which the potential donor says, he, you just met me five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, whatever. We never met before. Why are you already making such a tremendous ask of me? And he said, look, you know, we could have a couple of meetings. We could play golf together. We could, you know, about eight times we can meet and then I could do the ask. But you're busy. I'm busy. So I just decided we're going to cut to the chase and, and ask for what I'm asking for. And the man said, OK, let me think about it. So he calls him back a few days later and he said, um, and he said, I spoke to Donald and he said, Donald who? He said, well, Donald Trump. And this is, by the way, he wasn't President Trump. He wasn't, you know, we're not getting into politics here, but this is 2005, I think, or 2006. And he said that he let you use the set of The Apprentice for your show and he'd be the final judge. And because this person had been one of the lawyers for Donald Trump by the name of David Friedman. And one thing led to another that uh, I believe it was a short, a short time after is when the Iran crisis began. And uh, David Friedman, just as a regular, as we would say, ball of bust, as a regular businessman in New York, said, called his friend Ari Lightstone as knowing he was someone who was a man of responsibility and said, we have to do something. And he came up with a plan in 48 hours of how they're going to lobby Congress and get involved in everything. And that led to him working on the Marco Rubio campaign, which led to him being selected by David David Freeman as his chief of staff, et cetera, et cetera. Now, he just stood up a few times and said, like, I'm going to take responsibility for the kids in the middle, right? That's where it started. And by taking responsibility for the kids in the middle, 
that led to him being now one of the most famous diplomats in uh, the Jewish world or the world altogether, the top 20 in the world. that idea though what you said about you you start with something small and uh but but you, you just never know where it's going to lead because because the the almighty has a way of of uh, giving us what we ask for right we have the idea of mitzvah gerus mitzvah vera gerus vera that a mitzvah leads to more mitzvahs and transgressions lead to more transgressions the idea is that the almighty helps us in the way that we want to be so so i i would echo rabbi berg's suggestion to everybody out there that if, if these ideas are resonating with you about the importance of being Jewish, being like Moshe, being like Moses, taking responsibility, being like Rabbi Weinberg, both Rabbi Weinbergs, and, and really being a person of responsibility, ju just start doing something. Like, like just, just something. If you need an idea, call me up. I'll give you 10 suggestions. But just do something to show responsibility, to show that you take responsibility for others outside yourself. And, you'll, and it'll be amazing to see what happens after that. You know, I'll throw to the corollary idea before we go into the next question, Rabbi Berg, is that, um, that there's, uh, again, just, just a few feet from where you are right now, when the, when the base of Midrash, when the Holy Temple stood, there was uh, the, the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh Kedoshim, which was only utilized once a year on Yom Kippur by one person, by the high priest. And when he would come out of that place one time a year on Yom Kippur, the one person, the high priest, he would say, number of prayers. And we say them now on Yom Kippur. We, we echo them on Yom Kippur uh, and say the same prayers or say that these are the prayers that he said. And you'll notice it's fascinating because there is a, there's an order to the prayers of, of, of how he goes. And it's like concentric circles. He first prays for himself. 
Then he prays for his family. Then he prays for the kahuna, for all the other kohanim. And then he prays for the Jewish people and then for the world. And, and I once heard a fascinating idea that if you really want to affect change, somehow that's what you have to do. That that's your perspective. You have to make sure your core is solid, yourself. And then your family is solid. And then your community is solid. And that's how you affect change. You can do it through these concentric circles that have a ripple effect going out from the center to affect those uh, in the broader circle, so to speak. So Rabbi Berg, if I was to give you a gigantic billboard, it can be in the old city of Jerusalem where you are, it can be here on Cedar Road in Cleveland, and you had to use this billboard to help encourage people to take, to be re more responsible, right? And but to take on responsibility in a more serious way. What would you put on that billboard? I, I'll tell you what I put on the billboard and then I'll explain it because this is kind of like my life, uh, this is the way I've lived my life, frankly. Uh, I would put on there, if not you, who? I think those four words, if not you, who? Because so many times we're just thinking of like, oh, someone else can do this, someone else can do this. I've tried to, in my life, um, take jobs that I knew no one else could really do. And, you know, if you, if you look at my career, I never really, it's funny, like I've never really been engaged in, in, in these search committees with a couple different candidates because almost every job I took, no one else wanted. You know, they were uh, rebuilding jobs. They were jobs where we had to reform. There were issues that, that things fell apart. And uh, so therefore, I've always kind of looked at it like, can someone else do this? If someone else can do this, then I'm good. Let them go ahead and do this. I don't need to, to jockey to be the one to do whatever that thing is. You know, God gives every single person skills. Some of us are better speakers. Some of us are better writers. Some of us are better. You know, we have this conversation all the time in, in Jerusalem. You know, we get all kinds of different students. And sometimes you'll see a student like, oh, he's not so cool. He's this, he's that. He's, he has trouble looking in the eye when he speaks to you. He's not right. And then all of a sudden, this guy in today's day world becomes an incredible blogger, right? He could get his message out all over the place, you know? And so what we think is always like the typical kind of, hero, responsible leader, you know, like in Disney speak with like a cape and a, and a really, you know, that's not always who the hero is. And I think that that's, that's really, you know, if not you, who, meaning like, you know, you got to do what no one else can do. That's real responsibility. I'm not, now there are different forms of responsibility, by the way, you know, you, you get involved in a, in, in a Sadaka drive, this, that, but that's great. That's taking responsibility. But you want to take on serious responsibility for the almighty, then you identify what really, if I don't get this done, it's not going to get done. That's, to me, like the highest level of, of responsibility. And frankly, you know, as you know, we keep giving example after example, you know, go through the Bible. This is what happens over and over again. You know, and I always talk about the beginning of the Bible with Adam and Eve, right? What happens, right? Everyone knows the story, right? The snake gets Eve to eat the apple. She gets Adam. God shows up and says to Adam, Adam, what's going on here? He says, she made me do it. Goes to Eve, what he made literally right out of the gate, right? And what about their kids, Cain and Abel, right? Cain, after Cain, where's Abel, right? What does he say to God? Am I my brother's keeper, right? Am I my brother's keeper? And, and, I, and I always thought about this that these three words, this could also be another slogan, you know, on, on your billboard, right? You know, it's basically, Am I my brother's keeper? Really, all God wanted was him to reverse three letters I am my brother's keeper. That's all it had to be. And, and therefore, until you hit Abraham, their example after example, we don't have time today, but we can go through the entire Bible, where basically God wants people to take responsibility. And he wants you to take responsibility for things that if you don't do it, no one else can get it done. That's the, high, the highest level. So again, in my, the billboards, you know, that's what it's all about. It's just this, this, this shining a light on me and, and, and looking in the mirror and being honest with myself, right? Being honest with myself. So many times... We like we're dishonest about what we do. I do. I do this. I do the whole thing. Like, go out there and, and and do and and there's also sacrifice involved. You know, you mentioned Ari Lightstone, who we're both very good friends with, who became the deputy ambassador, the U.S. ambassador in Israel. What people don't know about this story is, right before he was offered the job, he bought a house in the Five Towns. Okay, he bought a house. He had a house. He invested a lot of money, and he just kind of moved in his house. And then he had to make a decision, right? And so that's sacrifice. There is sacrifice. Take responsibility will always entail sacrifice. It's not always so so sweet. And you know, like, oh, I went, I volunteered here, and I volunteered there, and you know, all these different pieces. There, there's always sacrifice is always connected to responsibility, and and you have to be willing to give something up if you really want to do it in a, its fullest sense. 
And, and, I'll, and I'll sing the praises of our, our guest here tonight. That this is in many ways why, I, as I mentioned, that why, Rabbi, why I don't have the opportunity to talk to Rabbi Berg every day or week or every month, and maybe even you know a few times a year, uh, usually through text or LinkedIn or whatever it is. But one of the one of the reasons that I look up to him and look to him as one of my mentors in this regard is because he is somebody who who practices exactly what we're talking about tonight. Because as we said, he's sitting there in Yerushalayim right now. He has six children. He took his whole life in New Jersey, which was a, a wonderful life, and said, you know, there's an amazing organization out there that's done amazing things for Kal Yisrael called Aisha Torah, and they need a new leader at the helm, because they're, since Rav Noah had passed away, they're whatever, there's a, well, we'll say there's a vacuum, we won't get into it now, there was a need for a, a strong leader at the top to really to, to really be the leader, and you know, he answered the call that uh, that Hillel, that Hillel Zakin, the great Hillel says in Pirkei Elvis, but makam she'en in a place where there are no men, is shtadal yosish, try to be a man, uh, and then one of the one of the ways that that idea was transmitted to me, as we talked about before, Rabbi Berg's responsible for giving me hooked on business books, but the, the Rebbe of, of business books, of organizational leadership, uh, Jim Collins, you know, Know, the way that he says it in, in Good to Great and then repeats in all his other books and just with different words so he can sell more books. But uh, the way he says it in Good to Great is, uh, by the way, by the way, BE 2.0 is included in that. I read it. it it's great. It's great. BE 2.0 is the ultimate Hazara of Cole Kisve, Jim Collins, if you want. But it's 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 a review. Um, so so the way that Jim Collins says this in Good to Great is he talks about the idea of a level five leader, uh, which he, you know, he talks about that's his top level leader. And the level five leader when in the, uh, in the, uh, the, in the decision between using a window or a mirror, he will, he will use a window and a mirror properly. What will he use a window for when it comes to giving honor? In other words, when something good happens in the company, he's always saying it was because of that person, it was because of that person, it was because of all, my, my team had nothing to do with it. But when it comes to a problem, that's when he uses the mirror. Right. In other words, if there's a problem, he right away says, it's me. It's for me to fix. It's for me to jump into. And that's the definition of a top level leader. I think that's what Hillel Zucke meant when he said strive to be a man. And and in all these wonderful examples that uh, that what it means to be a Jew is to uh, when there's a problem, you look in the mirror and see what can I do about it? You know, when there's when there's honor to be bestowed, you can look out the window at that point. But when it's you're trying to fix a problem, look in the mirror and say, what can I do about this? So, uh, you know, that's that's uh, that's that's right along the lines of what you're saying. So, Rabbi Berg, I want to I want to first of all, you've been so generous with your time. I know it's getting very late over there in Yushalayim, although seeing as you're leading an international organization, you probably have no clock. Uh you know, coming from Atlanta, we uh, Emmanuel Feldman Schlitter was the was the rub for many years. He wrote a book called Shul Without a Clock. I think being the head of an international organization, you're just the person without a clock. So, uh, but uh, before we wrap it up, any, any parting words or thoughts on on this topic or anything else? Yeah, look, I I, I want to keep it on topic because I, I to me being a Jew is about taking responsibility, and uh, I think you know kudos to you. You know, you take responsibility to. You know, to kind of get these tenets of Judaism out. And and I think that, you know, you ending kind of on this topic is it's it's the most important thing. You know, we're such a small percentage of the world population. But the one thing that that everyone knows about us is, you know, that Jews take care of Jews. And, and it's been our most powerful tool um, really for thousands of years. You know, there is enormous tractates of Talmud that talk about if a Jew is taken captive, the lengths we have to go to get that Jew back. And you know, if you if you look at you know medieval times, one of the things people always knew was like you know Jews would port to port. You would just show up and into another Jew and hey, I'm a Jew and brother and you know sister and and hug and, and move forward. And, and we can never ever 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 lose that. We can never lose that. It's literally our secret weapon. And I think that when people lose that bonding and connection and family, and, and that really comes through number one is a connection with the Almighty. I think you know without that connection, Almighty, we're not we're nothing to each other. And frankly, the Almighty gave us the Torah, the words of Torah, to explore, to understand. It's what, what builds us up. It what connects us to each other. The fact that I can show up to a synagogue anywhere in the world and open up the the Ark and see that that Torah is exactly like my Torah, right? That is is what connects us. And that kind of unity is is what's kept us for three thousand years, you know. And and I think it, it what what will keep us going. So that sense of, of responsibility. And and I think just. As a final note, what I said before, which is super important, which is it sounds like a lot of fun to go out and take responsibility, but just realize that we res with responsibility comes sacrifice. You have to be willing to sacrifice something. Sometimes it's time, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's other things, you know, there, but there comes a, a sacrifice because anything good in life takes an investment. 
And, and I think sometimes with good deeds, you know, like, well, you know, I want to be a doctor. So I'll put in my 10, 15 years ago, be a doctor. Well, what if you want to be a good person? Well, I don't really have time for that. And, and, and it's about sacrifice. It's about responsibility. You do those things, then you totally get what being a Jew is about. And then you, you just build this beautiful, incredible relationship with the almighty and your whole life just, it just rises on a qualitative level. Uh, that's pretty, pretty incredible. Hi, I'm Rabbi Pinchas Landis. If you've enjoyed this 10-part series, please consider supporting our efforts to continue creating more quality Torah content like the program that you've just enjoyed. So, Rabbi Berg, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for being here with us tonight, sharing these thoughts on responsibility. Uh, if you like what you heard, I know I did. I know I was inspired, but I know where to find Rabbi Berg, and you don't necessarily do. You don't necessarily yet, but uh, you can find him on h.com. You can find him on LinkedIn. He's very accessible on LinkedIn. You can find him on TorahAnytime.com. Is there any other place where a person should reach out to you if they want to connect with you, Rabbi Berg? Um, I- I'm easy. My email address is sberg at h.com, S-B-U-R-G at h.com. My cell phone number is 646-830-0872. WhatsApp is the best way to get me. Feel free to contact me anytime. Awesome. And by the way, he means it because when my son and I were in Yerushalayim a few uh, years ago, we wanted to get the view from the top of the H Center, H World Center. Right, Berg hooked us up. We got a great tour, got right to the top. Uh, hopefully this pandemic and soon we can all get back to Israel and get to that top Amen. of the H Center and get in Amen. the H Center. And yeah. uh, we look forward to seeing you in Yerushalayim. We look forward to uh, celebrating this concept of Jewish responsibility to hopefully make the Jewish people an even stronger nation. Thank you for being with us tonight. And thank you to Rabbi Berg. Pleasure. Thank you.
Good evening, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for being with us tonight for uh, for this session, for all the sessions, for the final session. And uh, first of all, before we open up the discussion, a quick plug for our next series starting, God willing, next Tuesday night. I can't believe it's time for a new series already. It will be the Jewish Destiny series in which we will be taking a, uh, a little bit of an approach like we had for Tuesday nights before the 10 Steps program. And that is we are going to be focusing on Jewish history. We'll start next week with 5,781 years ago, talking about creation. And we're gonna move laterally throughout Jewish history until we get to modern times. So that's gonna be the Jewish Destiny series starting next Tuesday night. If you like this format that we had with the interview uh, with special guests, the interview programs, we're gonna have a new program called Coffee Talk that will start in May. Coffee Talk will, will not necessarily be on a weeknight. We're gonna have it at different times in the calendar based on when our guests are available. Sometimes it'll be a lunch break program. Sometimes it'll be a night program, but not on Tuesday nights. So that will be, keep the format of the, the sort of the interview guest format. That's Coffee Talk coming to you in May. The Jewish Destiny series starts next Tuesday night. Stay tuned for both of these programs. They're going to be awesome. I, I want to I expound on just two things that we touched on in that discussion, really two stories. Uh, one is the story of Rabbi Neuberger, which we went through very quickly, but I, it's for me, it's such an inspiring story. So I wanted to delve into that just a bit deeper before we open up the floor. And that is Rabbi Neuberger was the, the uh, executive vice president of my yeshiva for the better part of, I don't know, 60 years. I, I think he came to the yeshiva as a refugee from Shanghai. Uh, he was a, of the, those Jews. Jews who fled Eastern Europe to go to Shanghai, spent, uh, spent the days in Shanghai during the war, came to America after the war, came to Baltimore, helped to start my yeshiva, and was there until he passed away in, I believe, 2005. So from 1945 to 2005, for those uh, 60 years, he ran the yeshiva. Now, they, they tell the story about him that in the 1940s, when he came as a 20-something-year-old single boy a, a German refugee via Shanghai to America, how he had a telephone installed in his dorm room because he started right away with that concept of responsibility of, of taking care of things for the yeshiva. Now, when he had a telephone installed in his dorm room in 1945 or 1946 or 47, whatever it was, most people didn't have telephones in their houses yet. And here he got a telephone put into his dorm room so he could get things taken care of for the yeshiva. So that just shows from a, from a very young age that sense of responsibility for the Jewish people. But, but I always was so inspired by what he did for the Iranian community, for the Persian community. Because, uh, you know, it, it's we, we take it for granted sometimes that Jewish institutions end up being a bit of a smorgasbord, end up being a melting pot with different cultures coming together. And and uh, quite often what happens in institutions is whatever the culture is of the institution, that's the culture that's followed for the student body. So like in our yeshiva, in our rabbinical schools, it was a, you know, mainstream Lithuanian style Ashkenazi yeshiva. And therefore the customs of the yeshiva were mainstream Lithuanian Ashkenazi. That's, that's what was... Was, that's what was done. That's what was followed. But when this program started for the Persian boys, uh, Rabbi Nuber was insistent that they should have their own program, meaning that for the classes, for the education, for, for all the learning, that should be together with, with the yeshiva, but for all the, the davening and the prayers, that they should have their own, their own customs, which is very unheard of, because usually in yeshivas, they're very big on having everybody praying together, you know, five, six, seven hundred people praying together every day. But Rabbi Nuber wanted the Iranian culture, the Persian culture to be preserved for these boys. And, and, the, and the, the, whole, the whole situation came from such a sense of responsibility that the Shah, when the Shah was in power, the Shah was a pro-Western, anti-radical uh, anti Islam leader, if you don't know Persian history. And what he did when he was the leader of Iran is he made many religious practices and institutions illegal. And one of the things that, that initially fell under that was, was yeshivas, that yeshivas were included as, as radical religious institutions and they became illegal. Now, Rabbi Neuberger and others lobbied the Shah to, to, allow, to allow yeshivas to, to exist in Iran. And that's where the whole program started. They would take the boys, the Iranian boys out of Iran, educate them in Baltimore. And the plan was to send them back to Iran to educate Iranian Jewry. 
Well, in 78, in the Iranian Revolution, when the Shah was overthrown, the Ayatollah uh, Khomeini and the, the radical Islamists that are now in power came to power. Those channels he used to be able to get as many Iranians out of Iran as he could. Men, women, children, not, not only students through the yeshiva. Anyone he could get out of, out of, the, uh, of Iran, he was, he was so focused on that. And, and they tell the story, someone told me a story once, I think this was Rabbi Spetner, who was my boss in Cincinnati, how he walked into Rabbi Neuberger's office about an hour after Yom Kippur, one, one year. Now, what do most of us do after Yom Kippur? As soon as Yom Kippur ends, we run to break the fast, we drink our orange juice, eat our cookies and our bagels and locks and whatever it is, we break the fast. And that's what we do right after Yom Kippur. This is about an hour after Yom Kippur. The, he walks into Rabbi Newberger's office, and Rabbi Newberger is sitting there, still wearing his kittel and his talus, meaning still in prayer garb from Yom Kippur, and he's on the phone. So, so in other words, the second Yom Kippur ends, when most of us are running to eat our bagels and locks, he was running to the phone to work on whatever the next, the next uh, so to speak, shipment of Iranian boys and girls and, 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 and grandparents was going to be. That's what he was focused on. I assume but at some point he broke his fast, but that's what, that's what he was running to do right after Yom Kippur. And, uh, and as Rabbi Berg spoke out, that I, I had, for, you know, the Iranian program was so prevalent, but there was the... Uh, there was the South American program and, and even NCSY. NCSY had camps on our campus in the summer uh, because Rabbi Neuber just had that expansive heart to do whatever he could for any Jew everywhere. And, and that's, where, that's, that's where I was educated. And, and hopefully I can emulate that in some way, shape or form. I want to jump now to Rabbi Berg and I'm going to pick on him a bit. I, I didn't want to do this when he was still on the call, but, uh, but there, there's something that's absolutely inspiring about him. And I believe the same character trait is inspiring about Rav Noach Weinberg, the founder of Eish Torah, who we reference. So Rav Noach Weinberg founded Eish Torah, I want to say, in the late 70s, early 80s. I forget the exact year. But what they often don't tell you, unless you read his biography, is that Eish Torah was, I believe, somewhere between the fifth and tenth institution he started. In other words, before he started Eish Torah, he so to speak, we could say he failed more than five times at starting an institution. Now, for anyone who ever reads the you know, leadership books, there's no such thing as failing, right? There's not wins and losses, there's wins and learning experiences. But Rabbi, Rabbi Rav Noah Kleinberg took that lesson to the nth degree and never stopped until he got it right with Asha Torah. And not only that, but somewhere in the process, he did have an institution called Shema Yisrael, which ended up becoming Or Sameach, where I also studied, which is in and of itself a huge institution. And there was a, a, uh, a disagreement at the top between him and the other founders, and he was basically asked to leave. So here, not only did he have many false starts in his institutions, he was even asked to leave the most successful attempt before he finally started Asia Torah. So that's the sense of responsibility sometimes that when we know we're doing the right thing, we don't stop until we get it right. We don't, we don't take the, the bumps in the road. We don't take the, uh, you know, like I said, there's no such thing as losses. There's just learning experiences. And that's what Rabbi uh, Noah Weinberg always exempl exemplified in his actions. But even Rabbi Berg in many ways is the same thing because what we didn't see say uh, on the call is when he left NCSY and the Orthodox Union to work for the Wiesenthal Center, th that might have struck some of you as, as a little bit of a strange move, going from the uh, being the managing director of the OU, the head of the international director of NCSY, to being a regional director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And it was a strange move because there was also a little bit of a... Um, Oh, we'll say egos got in the way. There's, I don't want to be too politically incorrect here because this is still on the live stream, but there were certain people within the infrastructure of the OU that thought Rabbi Berg was too young, that uh, they didn't want to give so much uh, responsibility over to, over to such a young man. And, and Rabbi Berg really felt that he was ready to take on the full helm and responsibility of the OU. And it ended up that at a certain point, he said, okay, you know, we obviously have a disagreement here. I don't want to fight. I'm just going to leave. And when he left NTSY and the OU, he did not have a Torah waiting for him. He did not have another international position waiting for him. He went to become, again, very respectable position. He did a great job, went to become a regional director for the Wiesenthal Center in a much smaller position. And then, you know, the, the talent like that wasn't going to stay in a regional position. And that's why Asia Torah, you know, and, and the match was made eventually with him and Asia Torah. And now he's literally running the, the world of Jewish outreach. So it's that idea that sometimes with responsibility, we're 
going to hit bumps along the way, but we just have to really, really stand up in the face of those bumps and keep persevering to be able to take on the responsibility of the Jewish people. So those are just some inspiring afterthoughts for me that, uh, that came from our conversation. But now I want to turn the conversation over to you, to the floor, uh, to see if there's any questions, comments, concerns, points of clarity for anything we said. Uh, anyone want to throw in a good joke or a bad joke? Now is your time. You can uh, you can raise your hand. You can unmute yourself and chime in. You can put in the chat box. The floor is whoever wants to take it. Okay, so I assume there was some sort of a mic drop here. Um, and uh, if there are no questions on this. I will, again, uh, encourage you all to join us next week uh, for the Jewish Destiny series, starting off next Tuesday night at 8 p.m. It'll once again be on Zoom format and, uh, and live stream to social media platforms. And, uh, and if you have any feedback for us, by the way, on the website, we've, we've passed, we've, we've posted feedback surveys uh, for each of the talks, but you don't have to fill out the survey. You can just email myself or know me or text us and, and give us your feedback on this program and give us feedback on what you want to see for future programs, because this is all about you, our, our dedicated people who are here week in and week out, and we want to keep giving you uh, what you want to hear. So I want to thank you all for participating in this amazing series. A tremendous Yasha Kayach to my wife, Nomi, who really, it was all her. The whole concept was hers. Uh, she does all our post-production. And, uh, you know, I just, I just, you know, stand here and smile and run my mouth. But, uh, but she really made this happen. And uh, I want to once again thank our, our amazing sponsors, David and Hetty Adler, who sponsored this series for us. And, uh, and we just look forward to more great opportunities together. So I want to thank you all. Wish you a Chag Kosher of Sameach. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week for the next series. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you.